Hello and welcome to One Week, One Year, a podcast where we watch and discuss a year of film history every week, starting from 1895, the dawn of cinema. This week is 1913. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Ellie. I'm a film projectionist, and joining me as always is... I'm Glenn Cobell. I'm a filmmaker. And joining me not as always, and for the first time a guest on the podcast is... Marco Rumo. I'm a film writer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I write film. <laughs> These intros are always so awkward. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're all like, I guess we do things. <laughs> anyway, uh, we are here in a, a bit of a new format. Um, uh, we're are, we're having our first guest, so welcome, Marco. Um, and right now, uh, the reason for this new format is because we're kind of moving into the era, a new era of film. Uh, it's it's feature films, motion pictures from here on out, baby. Um, <laughs> uh, and so we're doing a bit more of a focus on longer form stuff than dozens and dozens and dozens of short 15, five to fifteen minute long movies, hmm. which we're gonna. So we're gonna have a couple of different segments. Uh, we're gonna have one for shorts. We're gonna have one for serials, and we're gonna have one for feature films. Uh, and uh, so we're gonna start out uh, this week with um, with Phantomas um, in the shorts, or, or in the in the um, serials in the serials, uh, because uh, that's what Marco's here to talk about. Uh, but if you'd like a little more int- uh, uh, information about what our deal is, first off, we uh, we are a, you know this film history podcast, so we go through one one week at a time, one year at a time. That's the title, and uh, these are all old silent movies that uh, are copyright free. And so we have a playlist on our YouTube channel where you can watch uh, beforehand, so you can get the whole experience uh, uh, fresh. Um, or if you are, are watching this video on YouTube right now, we're going to put uh, some clips from the things that we're talking about up on screen while you're watching them uh, or while you're listening to us so you can watch along. Uh, but to start out, we like to give ourselves, as always, a little bit of historical context for the year 1913. So, Glenn, would you take it away? The news of the year 1913. Bolshevik activist Yosef Zhugashvili publishes his first article in the newspaper Social Democrat under a pseudonym, signed by a K. Stalin. He soon fully takes the surname. One month later, Stalin is arrested by the Russian secret police and sent to Siberia. Grand Central Terminal opens its doors in New York City, as of 1913, the largest railroad station. Dalai Lama Thubten Gyatso declares Tibetan independence from China. After 50 years on the throne, George I, the king of Greece, is assassinated. Scraping the sky, the Woolworth building is the tallest in the world, at 792 feet. Stravinsky's Rite of Spring premieres in Paris. A harsh entry into modernism as the strange new music and choreography causes such a ruckus the police get involved. Sweltering succotash, Death Valley, California hits the all-time hottest temperature on the planet, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Harry Brearley invents rustless steel, bringing affordable cutlery to the masses. The Fourth Congress of the International Psychoanalytical Association is held, the last time Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung will ever meet. The first transcontinental automobile roadway is completed. The Lincoln Highway stretches from Times Square, New York, to Lincoln Park, San Francisco. The Ford Motor Company introduces the first moving assembly line, ushering in the era of mass production. D.W. Griffith and Mary Pickford both split from Biograph. Pickford goes to the famous Players Film Company for $500 a week. Griffith heads to Mutual in California. Greener pastures and more creative freedom. Feature film explodes. Dozens of films reaching 40, 60, and even 150 minutes are released this year. And that is the news of the year. All that's fit to print or speak about. (laughs) I'm most impressed by uh, stainless steel. Yeah, yeah. That's I. I would have thought it would be much earlier, but uh, what did people uh, what eat with wood, wooden cutlery before? Yeah, like like Washington's teeth, and now teeth are made out of stainless steel. 
<laughs> we are all Jaws now. <laughs> I guess it's a sign of wealth if you like have metal that stains and you have servants to clean your cutlery. Right, like a like rusty teeth. Oh my god, rusty teeth! What a terrible oh, image. A terrible image. <laughs> <laughs> but but great band name. Rusty teeth. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, Marco. Um, what uh, what interested you in Phantomas? So um, I went to school for screenwriting, but I always had a particular interest in television, and I feel that serials are kind of like a proto TV in the way that they're serialized, obviously storytelling. And uh, I found, I found it to be an interesting peep into what moviegoers were experiencing. And uh, there's also a little bit of a comic book connection with Phantom Mas. There's a, an X-Men character named Phantom X who is uh, uh, inspired directly by Phantom Mas. So I was interested to see the source material and talk about it. Nice. Oh, I guess we should introduce this segment in general also. Glenn, what was this supposed to be called? The Cereal the Bowl? S- the Cereal Bowl was my idea of what to call it, yeah. <laughs> cereal spelled S-E-R-I-A-L. Yes. Yes. Of course. So here it is. Welcome to the Cereal Bowl. The Cereal Bowl. And we play music. <laughs> right, yeah, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> um... So where should we start? So the Phantomas, fa- Phantomas. Um, yeah, the O is like a U because there's like a little arrow over the O. So it's like fa- mm. Phantomas. It's a mix of Phantom, which is ghost, and As, which is ace. Like he's an ace thief. Mm. Oh, he's, a, he's an ace ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great name. Yeah, I didn't know the um, the etymology of it, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's a, port- a portmanteau. That's another French word for you. Yeah, you've been to France, yeah? Yes, I uh, did a summer in the Riviera uh, doing an international school to learn some French, and I did some journalism, a journalism course through my college. Awesome. We should we should go to you for all of the pronunciation. We've been having a really hard time this whole this this whole podcast. I did take three semesters of French, but. I still mess it up most of the time. As good as I am. I actually, when I was watching the first episode, I attempted to watch it without subtitles because I was used to things like Nosferatu and Metropolis that are kind of like sparing with the title cards. But Mm -hmm. Fantasy was like, you had to read (laughs) a lot. Yeah. Like there was no like, oh, well, I could, you know, I know enough French. I could pick up enough at like, by the time you got to the third letter and you had to read an entire letter, I was like, no, no, no. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah honestly i really appreciate it when when movies around this time have a lot of intertitles because the visual storytelling is sometimes so clumsy that without tons of intertitles it's sometimes hard to tell what's fundamentally even happening mm. um so i appreciate them um i do to- like to i do like to rag on some films occasionally for their over reliance on subtitles like whole scenes will happen just in intertitles. Yeah, you're almost I, reading a book. <laughs> I do not mind at all because some because sometimes I just like glaze over otherwise. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, there's a, a difference between active media and passive media, and I think it's interesting. I guess you guys will see it happen over your many episodes. Uh, film going from active to passive, where you can, can you can have a movie on in the background now or once uh, sat talkies happen. Whereas you have to put in a lot of work to experience a silent movie. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. They they demand a lot more of you. How how like how, how what's your what's your history with silent movies? Did you feel like this was demanding you to be a lot more active when you saw it? Um, well, my history is that I watched some in college because I would take film courses, but um, from working at our alma mater, the Alamo Draft House, I uh, <laughs> saw a lot of movies when they would do like the live orchestra and stuff like that. So that's that's how I saw Nosferatu and Metropolis. Yeah, this time. Um, and yeah, I think that this one didn't feel like homework, um, potentially because there was a lot to read. Um, I, I I agree with you that sometimes I could glaze over if it's too not if there's not enough to read. <laughs> 
for a while and it's relying overly relying on um their acting yeah well be glad you didn't watch some of the movies this week (laughs) (laughs) uh so this is uh louis fouillard uh working for gaumont and he uh, has he previously made I think I feel like the closest thing that he made to this before was the trust or battles for mm-hmm. money, yeah, um, which which was my favorite of whatever year that came out. Death, yeah, two years ago I think. I think so. Um, yeah. yeah, that movie was awesome. Um, and honestly, it, it it his experience in the field shows off in this because I feel like Fantomas is a very well put together uh uh just visually narratively um a lot of these movies waste a lot of time and i feel like phantom Mas is very efficient mm-hmm. yeah phantom Mas, i think is one of my favorite things that we've watched on this whole podcast yeah yeah it was um, good it, it slapped um i mean I, I think it it works very well uh from like a, a contemporary perspective like it's it feels very much faster paced and uh just like the sensibilities of it i think feel a bit more modern than a lot of the other things that we've been watching yeah um should we describe what phantomas is and what it's about definitely uh do you want to take that (laughs) sure uh so phantomas is a, a film serial so it is a a series of films uh sort of yeah, I think probably the, the closest modern equivalent would be uh, a TV show, but it was shown theatrically. Um, I'm not sure what. <laughs> yeah, small detail. Um, uh, so do, yeah, do the... you know how frequently the they come out? Oh, I uh, I didn't check specifically, but we... I knew that like three of them came out this year and the last two came out next year. Uh, so we're yeah. only going to be talking about the first three here. I'm not sure about the how quickly they came out, though. I believe it was, if not monthly, then like bi-monthly. They weren't that frequent. It wasn't weekly. <laughs> no, it wasn't Saturday nights. So let's go to the theater and watch Phantom Us. Wikipedia does not say. I was, thinking, <laughs> oh, well. I was thinking about how time consuming, like you went to the theater for like six hours <laughs> like for some of these. Yeah, yeah. This, this is something that I feel like takes a lot more like historical digging than we have been able to do. But I'm, I've been very curious about just the experience of mm. going to the theater at this time. Um, uh, we have all of these movies that are kind of a little divorced from their theatrical experience and uh it seems like yeah you would get like kind of a mix of different things up until this point you get a a a, a bevy of shorts all kind of stitched together and maybe like mm-hmm. a feature as well and, but yeah. Uh, yeah uh but yeah go on glenn um well the uh phantomas or phantomas to say it correctly um is a i guess sort of a crime thriller about the the title character who is a sort of mysterious gentleman thief master of disguise type but at least right when it started i was like oh okay he's like a gentleman thief he's like stealing stuff and then very quickly i realized that he is not he's not really an anti-hero he's much more of a villain (laughs) phantom is a bad dude yeah he murders people he frames people he like Killed cuts that, off people's hands with that snake or whatever <laughs> yeah he'll kill you with a snake um <laughs> but he kills he, people he, in a lot of different interesting ways in these yeah. three episodes um but he is yeah he's got all these different disguises all these different personas um all these different sort of wacky like escape techniques that he uses um he's a great character yeah and uh through these first three episodes, we kind of follow a few different characters. Um, I think the first episode focuses the most on Fantumas himself, whereas the second two, the second episode, um, Fantumas uh, versus Juve, uh, focuses more on uh, Inspector Juve, who is sort of Fantumas's uh, nemesis yeah. in the police department. He's trying to catch him. He's he's named after Javert too, as a, as a sort of uh, hat tip. Wow. Okay. And then the uh, the third the third episode, uh, the murderous corpse 
focuses more on um, uh, Fandor, who is a journalist who is also trying to catch and he, Fandomas. He was sort of like Juve's, um, or Juve's uh, Robin or Dr. Watson. Yeah. yeah. Second one. Um, and they, they have sort of a, parts parts of it have almost a sort of like buddy cop feel which uh i don't know if i don't know if we've watched stuff before that you could say this about but this might be the first buddy cop movie i don't know yeah yeah i could buy it (laughs) journalist team up (laughs) um yeah i was reminded of a lot of kind of contemporary genre things um like there's parts of it that feel kind of like a, a like a procedural um there's parts of it, it there's parts of it that are very funny there are parts that are kind of horrifying um yeah phantomas is like a scary dude at at points oh yeah um, like he's very intimidating <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i i was thinking of um silence of the lambs a lot um because you have especially in the third one huh <laughs> yeah oh, yeah yeah <laughs> Because uh, Fantumas uh, uh, de skins skins a person's hands <laughs> and uses his fingerprints. <laughs> yeah, uses them as gloves. That was very uh, Buffalo Bill. But even just like the uh, the brilliant criminal that like is always one step ahead of the the police is very like um, a huge genre in film and television. Like I am surprised that it exists this far in the past of like he's such a magnificent brilliant person and we can't stop him and you know there's like a love hate relationship that you know it, it's kind of like batman and joker where like when you have two people who are really passionate about one another there's like a weird like connection between the two characters like right all juve do- juve does is think about Fantumas, you know yeah um I, yeah i think uh another guess comparison you could make is uh professor moriarty from sherlock holmes stories is another sort of like criminal mastermind Mm -hmm. uh archetype um and yeah it it does this this is based on a series of french novels from around the same time definitely not after um but it the novelizations yeah (laughs) it it does feel kind of uh comic booky like i can definitely see the uh the um what's the right word the inspiration i guess Mm. or the the ways that um like comics in particular have sort of taken not maybe not from this series specifically but from this kind of uh like crime thriller genre genre. fiction in general i mean yeah soon soon after this you get pulp uh pulp stories which are the predecessor to comic books um and comic books are known for have, being a bit of a genre mishmash where you will have uh, crime thrillers and you'll also have sci-fi and horror. So they they do take from from stuff like this. And I, I totally got a comic booky vibe from this serial. Yeah. Um, and probably an even, an even more pulpy vibe. Like, yeah, it feels very, very pulpy. Yeah. Especially in, in like how I, the thing I was almost most shocked by with this is how amoral it is how like kind of disturbingly amoral it is um like i was reading into louis fuyat a bit and he's kind of like apparently he's kind of like a conservative dude but he's making these like lurid um uh like like creepy amoral uh uh, serials here i mean we've seen a lot of like varying different types of things from fuyat um so it's not like his his conservative personal life has bled into his work in the way that like D.W. Griffith has. Um, but still, these these movies are... Yeah, a comparison that I initially thought to make was with Arsène Lupin, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they were both written around the same time. Uh, Lupin predates Fantomas by a couple years. Um, but That's Lupin, kind of what I expected this to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. Even though my my only uh, I, I was not only was I expecting him to be you know friendly and more affable and and all that kind of thing, uh, I I don't even know the real Lupin. I just know the anime one, who's probably even 
you know, the, from the Miyazaki movie that I've seen, it's, it's yeah. even more silly. <laughs> yeah, that that is actually my only uh, my only actual like reference point for Lupin is Lupin the Third, the anime. <laughs> I watched the Netflix show, the a French um, Omar Sy led reboot that came out this year. Yeah, I heard that was great. Yeah, it, it's fun, um, and he's definitely a moral character in a way that like uh Fantumas is is not at all <laughs> um one thing that i think stuck out about i guess like the uh, uh the structure of these is they do feel structurally very much like tv episodes i think they each one is kind of broken down into smaller chapters or sections and i think each one is based on a separate novel but i mean the the first episode ends with uh, Inspector Juve sort of uh, declaring that he's going to try to catch him and uh, Fantumas kind of bloating or uh, you know showing off mm-hmm. um, and then that ends with it's like alright this rivalry has been established and I was like oh man I, got, I gotta watch the next episode <laughs> <laughs> you were hooked you were coming back to the cinema a month or two months later with that fresh in your brain thinking I gotta see what happens to good old Inspector Juve yeah um there's so much great like for for how sort of contemporary we're saying this feels it is full of great old-timey stuff also (laughs) there's there's a police report at the beginning of the second episode that uh inspector juve is sort of writing his thought process i guess and sort of like is this person really dead are they are they faking their death and then it just says mystery (laughs) which i wish that was in all re- police reports, just whenever they don't know something, they just write mystery. <laughs> um, I, I noticed the nu- the nunnery stuff was very old fashioned, where it was like anytime a woman was slightly exasperated or <laughs> overwhelmed, it was like get her to a convent. Like that's the only place that knows how to take care of her. Like it was uh, like their go to. And then I was sitting there thinking, like, wow, th- <laughs> there was there's no institution like that now. That's like a church like thing where you just sort of like leave babies and destitute women like you just like go up there and you're like you're a member of society here take our problem like I'm like this is such <laughs> a lost to time <laughs> i i wonder if that is if that actually happened as much as it seems like it does based on watching silent films from this era because it happens so much in silent films i don't think and it actually Hamlet. happened yeah it's like <laughs> pretty much any any like straight drama from europe at the very least is just always there's always a convent involved hunchback of notre dame i mean it's in the title yeah yeah and Uh, then the big twist at the end of episode two is that it appears that juve is dead yeah and then Um, three is like um the his little buddies like solo adventure like without his safety net of his big brother figure yeah we we can get into this because this episode three was my favorite one and a lot of it had to do with that plot point specifically Hmm. so yeah at the end of episode two fantomas blows up a house that he's been hiding in with juve inside and then we find out in the sort of pro like prologue of episode three that inspector juve uh has been declared dead and it's like, oh shit! I thought he was going to be kind of one of the main characters, but mm, all right, right, I guess not. But almost right away, we're introduced, or very quickly, we're introduced to this this character. Um, I did not write his name down. Um, oh, um, Cronajour. We, oui. um, who's working for uh, a fence, as as you know, sort of in Fentumas's crime network. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's sort of got like a soot, like a beard and like soot on his face. And I think we're told that he is like just a dumber than a bag of hammers. I thought, he had, had they... I thought he had impetigo when I first started watching it. Cause the way that the, <laughs> the makeup thing was, he had like white splotches. Sometimes I was like, Oh, who's this person? I, I was fooled. Am I dumb? Did you guys think, think that was you right away? I, I had a suspicion I thought he was someone because well, I didn't I didn't recognize the actor. I wasn't like, oh, that's him. Well, here's the thing. In the intro credits, they say that in the intro credits for every episode, they, they say 
you know, Rene Navarre, who is playing Fantomas, and they and they also uh, mm-hmm. uh, list all of the names of the other characters that he plays for his various disguises and alter right. egos. And in the opening credits for episode three, they they had the guy who plays Juve as Juve oh. and this guy. <laughs> oh damn it! Yeah. So I mean, I I didn't I didn't know for sure, but I I had a yeah. sneaking suspicion. And then there's all these little clues that they're giving you throughout the whole episode we're like following this 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 other character that we don't know and it's like oh the criminals use him because he's super dumb and he won't like give away any of their secrets but then we see him when he's alone he's like looking through binoculars and he's he's clearly pretty crafty and then uh while um while fandor is in the sewers trying to investigate he almost gets killed by one of Phantomas's uh underlings who's the uh the he works at the prison um yeah n- n- but Car- a bit. Caranjur saves him and so it's like all right there's you know there's something going on here um but they wait until the very end of the episode to the point where i was kind of convinced towards the end i was like oh i guess maybe juve is dead maybe this is just some other guy um and then uh juve in disguise meets fandor um, and asks him for a for a for a light for a cigarette, and then as he's leaving, he says, "Thanks, Fandor." And Fandor is like, "What? How does he know my name?" <laughs> and he chases after him, and then uh, he goes back. Juve goes back to his office, which we haven't seen since like the beginning of episode two. And just like that establishing shot of the office, I was like, "Oh shit, it's him!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so good. And then and then they 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 reconnect. And they're like, all right, now we can we can go take down Fantumas together. Now that uh he's been working undercover in his crime network. Oh, so good. Yeah, these movies are really uh they're really gripping. The storytelling is is fantastic. Uh and like the twists and turns really sell sell themselves. Uh I like um uh, to dip into some formal stuff for a second, uh, these movies are are quite good when it comes to mystery type uh, cinematography of kind of establishing important items and important uh, uh, set pieces uh, before they become relevant. Uh, yeah. One thing that I was really impressed by was in the very beginning of the first episode where it becomes... Uh, uh, very important the time that it takes this elevator to get from the top floor to the bottom floor uh, because within the elevator Fantumas is changing his costume and and finding a way to escape and knocking a guy out and everything um, but at the beginning you see this like the, you see the elevator going up to the, from the from the from the ground floor, the first floor, and then the second floor, and then the third floor. You're thinking like, why is it taking this long? You know, but it's like establishing, uh, it's establishing that sense of space. So it it you really know exactly how much of a ticking clock that Fantumas has to knock this guy out and steal his costume uh, when he's coming back down that elevator. Uh, a lot of little stuff like that in in these movies that I thought was really really good. Yeah, that's like fundamental like thriller filmmaking right there, like establishing space and time so that you know like when when the chips are down, when stuff's going on, you you understand what the <laughs> stakes are and sort of all that stuff. Have you guys been like um consistently surprised by things that seem more like they shouldn't be as modern as they should from watching some of these things? Like, wow, I didn't realize they, this person wrote romance really well, or this person wrote suspense really well. Like, just you underestimated the past. For sure, I think. I think there's a lot of stuff that I am consistently very surprised at how early some stuff is showing up, whether it be like sound film or color film or like different techniques and things. Um, and I'm like, oh, I didn't think this showed up for like 20 more years. Um, yeah, yeah, it's nothing's been, it's been very surprising. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, F- Phantomas uh, eventually goes on to 
inspire an Italian comic strip called Diabolic or Diabolique. I don't know how to pronounce it because it has a K in it and Italian does not normally have Ks in their names. And Diabolic is like where is an all black cat suit and has a assistant named Eva. And um, that's also enormously popular in Europe. It's like just a straight up ripoff <laughs> that <laughs> has hit as many uh, European readers as Fentumas has. And even Donald Duck in some Disney comics uh, uses the name Pepperonik or something like that. That's m- referenced to Diabolik and Fantumas. Like it's reverberated, especially in comic books. It's like gone through decades as various iterations. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Fantumas is, uh, I mean, I think the easiest way to describe him is a supervillain. Um he has like different disguises he has sort of a costume that he wears of like all black clothing with a hood and like (laughs) tight pants (laughs) (laughs) yeah it was like dread pirate roberts from princess bride with like an executioner mask (laughs) yeah um there's just there's so many i think we i gotta bring out just a couple of the great escapes that he makes there's one where uh juve and fandor have him by either arm and they're sort of taking him down the street to arrest him. <laughs> and then he, you find out that he had fake arms in his coat. And so he just ducks and runs away because they were holding fake, like, breakaway arms. <laughs> and then there's a an intertitle that just is 10 minutes later, and we see Fantomas is back at a different bar, like, drinking and partying. No, he goes back to the same bar, I think. Is it the same bar? No, like, yeah. He, Even like, better. He's hanging what, what out with a some legend. ladies. Yeah, he's hanging out with some ladies. That he's told that there are some people waiting for him outside. So he's like, excuse me, ladies, I'm going to go put on my coat and go outside. He puts on a, a coat with fake arms. He escapes. And then Juve and, uh, and, and Fandor go, ah, we lost him. And yeah. then Fantomas sneaks back into the party and starts hanging out with the ladies again. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of the third episode, when it's like, all right, Fandor and Juve are finally reunited. They're going to go catch him. And they have him like up against a wall, cornered. And he just, the wall just opens and he <laughs> goes through yep. and it closes again. I, did he plan for that exact situation? <laughs> you know, like he gets himself cornered in where he knows the breakaway wall is going to be. Did you like That's the great. reversal that um, they gave him calling cards? Uh, I didn't even pick up on that until just now, but that is amazing. He's like, Inspector Juve, Fandorf, what? <laughs> Juve is a lot. Like, ah, ah. Joke's on. Uh, You're the one with the calling cards now. We're in the game, too. Uh, so good. Surprisingly good. Yeah. I don't know. Um, what else can we say about this other than how good it is? The I think the only other thing that I, I need to say is that... Uh, Fantomas was Fantumas was truly the Jean Parmesan of his time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um that's how we should end. Just yeah. Yeah. That is true. Um Well yeah, I guess that about wraps it up for Fantomas. Uh or Fantumas. Fa- fan fan Fantumas. 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 Wait. Uh, the ace ghost himself. Uh, well, Marco, you're welcome back next week for uh, Phantomas uh, part two for us. Uh, episodes four and five for most people. Star um, Wars. Uh, <laughs> do you have anything that uh, anywhere you'd like people to check you out or that kind of thing? Yes, if you want to read anything I've written about movies, you could go to Story Screen Beacon, where I have a few articles uh, from me, Marco Rumo, R-U-M-M-O. And then uh, on Twitter and Instagram and everywhere, I'm at Fleetwood Marco, like Fleetwood Mac, but Marco instead of Mac. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks to you, our inaugural guest. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. Okay, I guess uh, we'll move on to our next segment now, now that we're doing segments. 
very economical. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's time to move on to the next segment. Uh, our next segment is our shorts segment. Yeah, which we don't really have a good name for. Well, you give your name, and I'll give my name for it. I wanted to call it short sides. Mm-hmm. Like pancakes. Like, well. Yeah, like it's a side, like it's a side, you know, the shorts are on the side, uh-huh. but then also like short, short siding is a cinematography term. So, right. you know, there's a connection there. Uh, I was going to call it one week, one reel. Uh. That one is way better. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what we land on. If anybody has any, uh, any suggestions, leave them in the comments. <laughs> uh, I think we might as well start out with, uh, the 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 banger short here the which is suspense by lois weber yeah also kind of in keeping with the theme of like crime suspense stories. yeah definitely um suspense is great it's so cool um yeah it's another adaptation of the lonely villa story <laughs> yeah it's a a lonely villa like yeah oh uh, um, this one it said it's that they they said that it's adapted from the original like lonely villa was and it's not the nth dw retread of that same thing but but yeah <laughs> yeah but it, it basically is yes um but way better like taking that that sort of concept of someone trapped in a house and calling for help um and intercutting between the person trapped the per the person kind of threatening them and then the person they're calling for help um and you're cutting between the three of them but doing it so much better than griffith does in any of his versions of it yeah probably the most um, impressive version that he did was the lone dale operator uh but this movie has mm-hmm. oh my god it has so much style it's ridiculous yeah <laughs> Ooz, oozing with style it has a three-way split screen triangle shot yeah that is like incorporated into even like it's motivated by the set because there's a sort of like cone shaped light hanging over the guy in the middle. Oh, wow. That is sort of creating this like triangle point yeah. at the top of that frame. Yeah. And then the other two, it's great. Huh? If you're just listening to the podcast, like go watch it on the YouTube channel or like watch the YouTube version of the, of the yeah, show. I think it's on, I think um, that one might be on the pioneer set on Netflix too. I'm not sure actually. We'll make the we'll make that the thumbnail. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's yeah. It'll be the thumbnail so you can see what we're talking about. Uh, one of the insert shots in there too is the, uh, the what is he? Is a tramp or something? They call him uh, uh, a vagrant. Yeah, the the, the uh, one is the the husband in the middle with the light. The other one is the terrified wife, and then another one is like a hand of the tramp reaching underneath their their mat to find the key there Mm -hmm. and it's it's such a i mean there's so much dynamism in that shot it's kind of ridiculous yeah there's an amazing top-down pov shot yeah of the of the the prowler the i don't know the the bad guy they call him the tramp Um, in the in the movie um where uh the wife looks out the window straight down at him yeah lady in the tramp um she looks out the window down at him as he's trying to break in, and he looks up at her. Yeah. And when he looks up, we get a top-down close-up of him looking up into the camera. And it is the most modern-feeling shot in anything that we've seen, maybe. It's yeah. like... Similar to Musketeers of Pig Alley from last year, like that kind of real close-up, but then from above. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Wild. So it's like a motivated POV shot looking down um it's so good there are some other there are a couple other shots looking down from above in this movie one of them is uh uh, or or they're both they're both from the same angle but with different characters where it's looking down at the front door of the house and it's looking down through these kind of like spy uh, these horizontal like wooden poles uh above the Mm -hmm. the terrace i guess whatever you would call it um and so it's it's got these kind of like really wild diagonal lines going through it and then you're seeing people walking in and out the door a needlessly showy shot but it just adds to all of the style in this movie yeah there's a lot of 
I I wouldn't say all of them are needlessly showy. That probably is the most needlessly showy. Yeah. Um, it does sort of have like a, vo- a voyeuristic feeling to it, which kind of adds to the the suspense of it all. True. Um, another one of my favorite shots in this is uh, as the uh, so the the husband in his attempt to get home quickly steals someone's car, and then gets chased by the police all the way back. And as he's getting chased, there's a shot of the rear view mirror of the car. Yes. And in the mirror, you can see the police car chasing them. It is. It's so economical. It's so stylish. It's it's wonderful. And this is this, by the way, is uh, Lois Weber and Philip Smalley, uh, who are a husband and wife mm-hmm. team. Um, but she's kind of taking the helm on some of the movies they do together. And he's taking and they kind of collab on on the other ones. Um and she um, is probably could be considered the second big female filmmaker. Um, yeah, first first American born female filmmaker. Mm. And as far as as far as I know, uh, uh, Elise Guy and Herbert Blaché have both claimed that they were the ones that gave Lois Weber her start. Uh, uh, let's let's believe Elise Guy because she's more believable yeah. about everything. <laughs> um they did another film that i i kind of i'm not gonna lie i kind of speed watched a little bit yeah same uh called the rosary um which isn't really that uh the the plot of it is is nothing that special it's another sort of griffith e plot which is a it's a civil war story it's painted Um, in really kind of broad sketches though yeah um but the thing about it that really stands out is that it has a uh instead of using a a a, a, rec- a square rectangular frame it has a circular frame with a rosary necklace around it yeah and so yeah like around the circle are all of the beads and then on top of all of the shots superimposed is a is a cross hanging down in front of them um I saw it, this called sort of like an art film, which I could get behind in a way. I don't think it was at the time, though. I think watching it now, it's like, oh, this is like an experimental art thing. Right. I think back then it was it was experimental, but it was just sort of like, hey, why not? Yeah. I mean, it reminded me of Spring by Louis Fouillard yeah. in, in, in mm-hmm. its use of circular frames. Um, and yeah, just kind of casually formally expor- experimental uh, i mean i think this is the uh, lois um lois weber made something last week that we didn't talk about um but she's going to be picking up a lot now and i'm i'm really excited for her output uh based on these two definitely yeah both of them are definitely very kind of like innovative um, or at the very least, forward-looking, if not necessarily innovative. I don't know if they're if they're really doing anything that hasn't been done before. I mean, those downward shots, I don't think have been done before in from suspense. I mean, I do think there's been shots looking straight down before, mm-hmm. even if they were just like uh, documentary things. Um, right. But to the point where they these are like motivated by a character looking down and things like that are definitely very it's some of the most uh accomplished sort of like film language that we've watched so far i think yeah for sure um and then on the other end of the spectrum is uh the bangville police (laughs) (laughs) yeah um which is a very important milestone film i guess so Maybe not very important. Notable. It's so. Here's the thing, though. I think what the reason you're saying that is because it's the first Keystone Cops movie. Mm-hmm. But I was just looking a little into it. Like everybody calls it the first Keystone Cops movie, but it's not. Um, it's. <laughs> Wait, what? No, it's like it's like the sixth or something like that. Ah, uh, we've been sold a lot. Yeah, is it? Just, it's the oldest one that survives. It, not that... even. No, it's just the first. Uh, it's yeah, the first yeah, one yeah. that really popped off. It's the first one that's po- that was popular. Oh, okay. Um, and these are the Keystone Keystone Cops, as in, uh, Max Sennett's Studio Keystone, and they uh, are coming up with these kind of 
I feel like more branded players than than mm-hmm. other groups. Um, so they've got the Keystone Cops. Uh, I mean, I think Fatty Arbuckle is from Keystone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, Charlie Chaplin, of course, and who we're going to get to next week. And, yeah. uh, you know, Mabel Norman, she's got that kind of star power. I feel like she's got the star power of a Mary Pickford, but comedy, comedy wise, you know? Yeah. No, th- I think that's a, a, an apt comparison. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a, a lost film, or at least I can't find it anywhere, um, which is another Keystone film, uh, A Noise from the Deep, which, according to the internet, is the first time a pie was thrown into someone's That's face on true. film? Damn it! There was you're debunking all of my Wikipedia <laughs> research. No, I saw that. There was there was a there was one from a couple of years ago that was an earlier pie in the face. I forget the name of. Well, it, it was it was a pie smash in the face. Though was it thrown? Oh, though? I'm not sure. I actually didn't watch it. <laughs> okay, I think Noise from the Deep is the first thrown pie. Okay, not just pie mash. All right, cool, cool. Um, and that that was also the first pairing of Mabel Normand and Fetty Arbuckle. Um, and so this movie is with Mabel Normand. It's a pretty simple story of just, it's actually almost kind of Lonely Villa-esque. It is. <laughs> I had that in my notes. This is another Lonely Villa-like, but as a comedy. Yeah. And I actually think this story kind of works better as a comedy. Yeah. I yeah, I suppose so. There's like it leaves a lot of room for hijinks and misunderstandings, which this movie rings a lot out yeah. of. Well, I I don't necessarily think it works better as a comedy because I, I do think I think Lonely Villa and Lone Dale Operator and Suspense all work pretty well at what they're trying to do. Yeah. Um, one thing that one thing that I think sticks out about Bangville Police because it was made around the same time as D.W. Griffith was making his movies is it kind of feels like a direct parody a little bit oh interesting I don't know if it was intended that way I could see that but it it like has such a similar setup and then sort of like breaks that premise apart as it goes along where it's like the 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 invading sort of vagrants yeah that are always the villains in these turn out to just be some guys passing through and don't really <laughs> They're not trying to cause mischief. <laughs> um, it's just this woman like freaking out because she sees a, some some people passing through that she doesn't recognize. Uh, well, Max Sennett and D.W. were tight at some point, um, so I don't know. There could be there could be some shared DNA yeah. there. I I don't know if it was intended that way, but that's sort of how I watched it. I can see that. I can read <laughs> it that way. The other joke that I want to make is that Bangville Police sounds like the hot cops from. Uh, Arrested Development. It does. Very much. That's our second Arrested Development joke this episode. <laughs> Gotta keep them coming. Um, uh, to transition, I guess we could talk about another car chase film, if you could call it that. You're speaking of uh, Matrimony's Speed Limit. By Elise Guy Yes. This one's, this um, one's a lot of fun. <laughs> except for one part <laughs> oh my god oh my god yeah there is a very yikes moment in this movie <laughs> yeah a moment that does sort of make make me rethink we've been sort of praising elise guy Blaché here on this show as a sort of um uncharacteristically progressive figure of the time and uh, ooh, maybe not as much as uh, we would like <laughs> she's not perfect certainly no she puts a, a very racist joke in this movie uh that uh i don't want to even say want to say it didn't age well because it was pretty bad at the time too yeah um but other than that um this is a fun premise uh yeah basically there's this guy uh uh a husband and or, or no no like um some boyfriend and girlfriend fiance situation um where uh the the guy works on a stock market and he just had a terrible day and he lost everything and the woman uh has all of this institutional wealth and money and she's like hey man i know you're doing you're not doing great so i can just give you money you know i could just help you out and he says no i cannot i <laughs> <laughs> My my honor is 
besmirched by you offer it by you a woman offering me money so i'm gonna break up with you and go stick it out on my own uh and she uh hatches a plan to <laughs> she ha- this is very messed up what she does but <laughs> it's also very funny she hatches a plan to uh win him back and uh get him the money that he needs uh and and also win his hand in marriage and so she fakes a telegram saying that his aunt has died and has left him a ton of money but only if he gets married by noon that day (laughs) (laughs) and so he's like yippee my problems are solved uh and but then he realizes that he only has 12 minutes, so he goes running around, like, frantically trying to propose to the first person that he sees, and one and, and then another. And she's, you know, she knows the plan, so she's running, she's racing in the car to his office. Uh, and and he's kind of walking out in the street, kind of vaguely back toward her house or something like that. Uh, they pass each other, but while while she's got, like, a minister in tow... <laughs> waiting <laughs> waiting to uh to to marry him within a couple minutes uh he's just like all these random people will you marry me will you marry me yeah i, I only have five minutes See, can you marry me <laughs> um yeah and like he goes back to her house but she's left to go meet him at his office and so she ends up at his office but he left to go to her house and so yeah switcheroo um the the, yeah but the 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 bad the bad yikes bit is that um one of the people that he he tries to propose to um she's got like a veil over her head and and he's like oh my god like this is a pretty lady i'm gonna propose to her right now and then she lifts the veil up and she's black and he's like oh god (laughs) and oh no i'm racist i can't do that (laughs) yeah seriously I I wonder, like, I mean, I think at this time, right? I mean, at least he is the punchline of that moment. It is sort of like... Maybe. It, maybe. it is. I do think, I do think it is, considering the time, I think it was made in kind of bad faith. I don't even um, know if he's the punchline. I think it's like, it's like, whoa, gross, you know? Um, I mean, I will say that I, I'm guessing that the idea is less a black person is gross and more race mixing is uncouth. Um, and marrying outside of your race is something that's not really done in 1913. Uh, but still it it comes off awful. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) At least gee, why? How could you, (sighs) we we thought you were better than this. At least after that other racist joke in the cabbage patch movie. Oh, that's right. That was a kind of similar joke, isn't it? A very similar joke, yeah. Um, uh, the other movie we checked out uh, from from Elise Guy at Solax this year was A House Divided. Which is very it's good. It's so funny. It's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> a House Divided is a great sitcom episode. Yes. It has very sitcom-y vibes. Uh, yeah. Almost like an I Love Lucy episode, honestly. Uh-huh. And also is like one of the more like genuinely sweet heartfelt movies that i can think of that we've watched huh i don't know i i had a, like an upswelling of of heartfelt joy at the end of this one i was just like ah oh, it's so nice <laughs> you want to sum it up um yeah i mean it's uh it's uh, a married couple who are living together that both through various misunderstandings think that the other person is cheating on them even though they're not. Um, And so they decide to talk to a lawyer and figure out a system where they are going to continue to live in the same house, but not speak to each other. Yeah. To avoid the disgrace of divorce, they're going to get, yeah, they they will live separately together. It said, Um, yeah. Um, Kind of using the lawyer as like an intermediary. Yeah. Um, And they both sign this document saying they're going to do this. Um, and so then we see all the hijinks of them trying to go through their kind of daily lives in the house without 
without like without talking to each other or like interacting. Yeah, in the contract they sign, it says that they'll only communicate via correspondence. Um, yeah, which is actually pretty handy for a silent film because they're writing down everything that they're saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, th- through I don't remember exactly what the catalyst for it is, but through it all, they they sort of. You can kind of see them start to some of the cracks start to break in their facade of being mad at each other. They'll sort of like be mad, but then they'll they'll kind of start getting along again. But then kind of remember that they're supposed to be mad at each other. Yeah, yeah. And then like go back to it. They'll like start laughing and then be like, oh no, we're we're still mad. <laughs> um, and then by the end of it, they've sort of they they come to a point where they're like, this is dumb. Let's just be happy and talk to each other again. Yeah. And then the lawyer comes in and is like, no, 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 you're. You're breaking your contract. Lawyers love contracts. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's what they do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just just a all around fun one. And the the acting, the comedic acting in this is so funny. Yeah. Like the way, I, the, the, the looks on their faces when they're like, no, I'm supposed to be mad, you know? Uh, yeah. It's really good. As cackling. It it sells both the comedy of it and also the, the heart of it really well. Yeah. Um I mean the only other I think we can sort of quickly mention a couple sort of technical uh milestones or um I don't know, standouts. There are uh I guess two films. There's there's neither of them are sort of singular films, they're sort of s- series series of short experimental films one is the uh, edison uh kinetophone films mm-hmm. um which are sync sound from 1913 uh-huh. there's been sync sound one. before this kind of um and it's still kind of it's still a very uh, early crude version of it. But it's they made a um, a bunch of films with this kinetophone technique, um, but destroyed in a fire in 1914, and they abandoned the uh, this whole technique. Oh wow! Um, which was sort of time consuming, and they had other problems anyway, but. Um, I don't know. It's just it's wild that they were sort of starting to figure out sync sound this early, and then kind of abandon it. They're like, ah, it's too much work. That is kind of weird that they would <laughs> abandon it. You know, cinema is still in a pretty gimmicky zone. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the thing is with sound and color at this time, though they were possible, they required a lot of specialized equipment, um, and finesse that didn't always quite yeah. work out. Yeah, they weren't really the most practical things. They were very clunky, as evidenced by uh, the other one, which is the the Gaumont color films from 1913. Yeah, which are super impressive. They the, they look they look amazing. Yeah, when they're done right, which I guess most of the time yeah. they weren't. They were not. Yeah. Um. They they were achieved by shooting and projecting black and white film through three separate different color lenses. It had to be very precisely aligned and tilted in order to get the colors to line up right. Um, but because it's it's three colors, um, it it's much closer to the human eye than like two color film, which yeah. was another sort of what I associate with like pre nineteen thirties color film. Yeah. Um, and this looks way better than that. Yeah. It looks much more like something from the forties or fifties. Yeah, definitely. It's funny because it's it's this kind of combination of washed out and rich. Uh, the colors yeah um, particularly um there's this one image of like a, a mistletoe uh that's just kind of like rotating and you're just seeing like the the reds and the greens and they they look oh they look so good um it's it's yeah it's really impressive to look at um um but that that too was abandoned pretty quickly because they were just like we can't yeah this is too much trouble in 1914 too <laughs> yeah um and then the only other thing I mean I want to talk about uh, we didn't watch any D.W. Griffith short films from 1913. Um, he's kind of just a bit 
in a bit of a holding pattern as far as I can tell in terms of like these same sort of stories that he's telling. Um, there is, however, a sort of notable thing that 1913 might be the origin of his sort of overinflated importance to film technique, sort of in film history. Right. As 19, in 1913, he left Biograph um, and as a sort of victory lap fuck you to Biograph, I guess, <laughs> he took out a newspaper ad, like a full page newspaper ad, where he basically took credit for all of their success. He it was like D.W. Griffith, the the master behind all of Biograph's films. And it's like, hang on, he came in like at, way after they were established. Um That's true. And uh so he put this ad in the paper. I don't know if he wrote it himself, but he is responsible for it 100%. And the ad itself, which you can look up and find online, uh, gives him credit for uh, revolutionizing motion picture, motion pictures and founding the modern technique of the art, which is some bullshit. Not true. Um, yeah. As well as <laughs> introducing close-ups, sustained suspense. Uh, the switchback, which is what he calls cross-cutting. Oh, that's funny. Um, none of which he came up with. <laughs> All of which had been done before he did them. A lot of them he did quite well. But... Yeah. But... He he certainly refined them. He certainly put them to better use than they had been done before. Yeah. But he did not introduce them. No. Um, nor did he found the modern technique of the art. Um, and so I, I always kind of knew that uh, Griffith was kind of given a little bit too much credit as a an innovator, as sort of like, um, you know, he's he he is given so much importance in film history, yeah. especially as a sort of like groundbreaking filmmaker. Um, what I didn't know was that that's because he gave himself that credit. <laughs> he did it himself. Wow. He was like, no, 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 that was all me. I did all that. That's really interesting. Because oh. like, yeah. I hate him so much. <laughs> this is, you know, because a lot of records are not super great from this time. Uh, and it's also... Yeah, no one could, no one could fact check right. it. Right. Because it's like, you couldn't just pull up, like, you know, all of, uh, like, Edwin S. Porter's films on YouTube to check. No. Um, and, and this was also a time full of hucksters. And so a lot of... I'm sure a lot of our understanding of what is true about technology and especially Edison related technology at this time mm. uh, is lies that we have th that <laughs> it's lies and propaganda that we have incorporated into our actual history through power yeah. of marketing, you know? Yeah. Um, it's wild. I guess we're engaging in a little historiography here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have to give full credit to uh, Karina Longworth and her podcast, uh, You Must Remember This, which is a much more well-researched and classy film podcast than ours. <laughs> and if you like this podcast, I wholeheartedly recommend that one. Well, we're um, not classy. It's, much more, <laughs> it's more like 1930s 19, to like 1950s sort of Hollywood film history, yeah. which I'm sure we'll get into. But... Um, I don't know, I I wanted to at least give credit where credit is due. That's where I learned that. Uh, I need to finish that episode. I'm partway through it. Um, and I we can be classy, but come on. No, you, no, I I'm yeah. just joking. I know we're not classy. We we gotta we gotta at least own own what our lane is. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's right. We're the bad boys of silent film, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, speaking of silent film, uh, here, here we go. We are watching some films now. Yeah. Like we watched a couple of feature length films, uh, before, but this, this year they're really blowing up as that fellow in yeah. the, in the news broadcast said. Yeah. That very smart and, uh, well-spoken fellow in the news segment. <laughs> um, yeah, we're on to our. Our last segment, the feature presentation. This is, this is where we we uh, we play that the thing from the VHS tape when it oh. would go from the previews to the. I dig it. I dig it. And now we're 
pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Where do you want to start? We watched uh, <sighs> a, a handful of feature films, all of which were long and important. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't why don't we start with uh, Traffic and Souls? Okay. Um, which is directed by George Lone Tucker for the Independent Moving Pictures Company. Which uh, would go on to become Universal. Or Universal was involved in this somehow. I have it written down as it's a Universal picture. I think Universal distributed it, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that sounds good. And then correct. it was produced by Independent Moving Pictures. Um, but also, Universal is, I think, I don't know if it holds the claim for like the oldest, or, like the longest running American film studio. I think it's the oldest still surviving, right? I believe so, because I think most of the others have been bought and sort of repackaged yeah. enough times that they don't, they're not really the same thing, whereas Universal has remained Universal. Um, this had the alternate title of, uh, while New York sleeps, which I kind of like better. Yeah. They're, they're both fine. They're both very sensationalistic, which this film is very much. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the basic, I rather liked this one, which I know that you didn't know. I no. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the basic idea of this is that it is sort of a peak into the world of uh of white slavery uh in new york or human trafficking human, tra- which human is trafficking what we now call it because it is a better thing to call that's it that's true it it they called it white <laughs> slavery back then they also did call it human trafficking back then which i didn't realize until i watched this movie uh so this involves kind of a couple different levels of of an organization there there's this there's this syndicate that uh basically ha- uh, their their whole specialty is taking swedish people who are fresh off the boat and uh tricking them into uh into becoming prostitutes and and getting getting uh uh stuck in their brothel um, and uh, with their kind of mer- merciless guards, and then they've got some kind of head honcho business people. It's all led by this guy named William Trubus. Um, <laughs> Such a good <laughs> villain name. Uh, and so it involves uh, some some captured kind of people. It involves a couple of sisters who end up uh, getting involved in this uh, uh, as case crackers slash victims um Mm -hmm. and it involves uh the the cops uh uh, who are trying to trying to catch them yeah i mean it's um it's six reels uh it's about 88 minutes um and i thought it was it felt to me like a proper feature as opposed to a sort of longer version of a one or two real movie that's just been stretched right to an absurd length. This actually packs it packs a lot of plot into its runtime. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, I'll say that like the plotting was the plotting slash editing, which is kind of they're they're tied in silent film a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, is part of my issue with it. I think the movie gets a lot better about a two third, like a third or a half of the way through, but the beginning of it is like kind of incoherent um, to me. Um, it cuts around a lot, and uh, it's it it moves between different characters and places very quickly, and it it takes a while to kind of get your bearings as to what is happening. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this movie heard about the trick of cross cutting and just decided like oh we're gonna do that you know without even thinking about why they were doing it because there were so many unmotivated cross cuts in this movie and it was disorienting um yeah uh 
but I, you know, one place that the cross cutting I thought was used really well was in the the police confrontation where um, the cops end up getting, uh, you know, surround surrounding this building and and uh, kind of all orienting themselves at the same time to like at the sound of a whistle bust in and and arrest everybody and, and save the other ones. You know, that was that was quite good, and the cross cutting built up a lot of tension in those scenes yeah yeah building up yeah sort of the different groups of of police like outside the building the like one sort of uh like hero character uh officer burke or i think detective burke uh later in the film um uh who is in a romantic relationship with one of the two sisters um and yeah it's just like this big like raid shootout scene there's like uh the like one of the main like kidnapper characters is uh gets into a fight with with burke and is shot and falls off the roof um actually reminding me of a film that me and you made yeah, Chris. yeah. um where there's a dummy that gets thrown off a roof um and then so the 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 sort of main villain of this trubus is this sort of like wealthy high society uh, man, and he he has a whole family that doesn't know he's involved in in his nefarious dealings. Um, and so after after the big police raid, the the they go to arrest him. Um, and uh, he gets arrested, but then like his uh, uh his wife leaves him, or no, his wife dies. Uh, sort of, I think the implication is sort of that she might have killed herself. Um, but Trubus gets released on bail because he's rich, but then, like, everyone hates him. Like, he tries to, like, go back to his old, he, like, as he, as soon as he walks out of the station, like, everyone's just, just like, hates this guy. Yeah, yeah. Because they all found out about that he is a human trafficker. the head of a human trafficking yeah. ring. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of characters in it. There's a lot of, uh, there's, like, a whole section where one of the sisters, uh, Mary, is trying to sort of uncover this plot and uh gets job at uh as trubus's new secretary and discovers his like secret listening device in the office where he can listen to the criminals the floor down and they uh they come up with this this plan to like record him on the dictaphone you find out that the, the sister's dad at the beginning is introduced as an inventor yeah and then later, later in this scene, it gets brought back to like, oh, he can invent a thing that can listen to the dictaphone. That was pretty um, cool, like the whole espionage element of it. Uh, her sneaking around, she, she, um, he, the the thing that he records is onto these wax, these Edison wax cylinders, yeah, uh, which we haven't seen depicted before um, on film. Um, and uh, and yeah, so she's trying to like smuggle these wax cylinders and this big briefcase size recording device uh, into her boss's office to surreptitiously record him. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I thought that was a nice sort of like uh, setup and payoff with uh, with their dad as like, oh, he's an inventor, and then later he like invents the thing that they need. Uh, I would say that. They introduce him as an inventor, do nothing with him, and then and then the second that there's an invention needed, they say, "Oh, there's an inventor here." You know, true, but still, I mean, I you know the the bar is kind of low in terms of like feature length storytelling at this point. I think. I think Phantomas does it way better. <laughs> hey, look, of course, Phantomas does it way better. No one's gonna argue that point, but um, I I did I watched this before Phantomas, so I I hadn't. The bar hadn't been raised that high mm-hmm. yet. Um, well, that's the thing. It's just the French are way better at everything yeah. than the Americans are in particular. Um, and they're well, still... they've been doing it for longer. Yeah. yeah. They arguably invented the whole thing, so... Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed this. I thought it it uh, it was paced better than a lot of the other features that we've watched. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, had, it has some really... Uh, well done sequences in it for sure yeah, you know what you're you're right i i think the beginning the messy beginning really turned me off but there was some there was a lot of good stuff in this movie yeah. 
I will say that, in general, I liked the white slave handle better. The um, the Danish movie the, that was about the mm-hmm. same kind of thing. Uh, much cleaner movie. Uh, and Much shorter movie. Much shorter too. movie. <laughs> and it also had a three-way um, uh, split screen before Suspense did. Yeah. Um, Not a triangle split screen, though. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the director... How's this for a segue? The director of The White Slave Handle uh, is August Blanc, uh, who directed Atlantis, which is another one that we're talking about. Very good segue. This is the first Danish feature film. And similarly to uh, uh, Traffic and Souls, it, uh, it does have very good, like, it does have very good production value yeah. and storytelling technique in it. However... I'm of the opinion that the story this film tells is garbage. <laughs> See, I kind of like this one. This one it was probably actually the the feature film that I liked the best out of all of them. Hmm. Um, this uh, is about a boat uh, a, a boat disaster. Um, yeah. This was uh, uh, based on a novel. That came out a month before the Titanic disaster. Uh, Coincidence or not? It turns out that uh, Gerhard Hauptmann, the, dire- the the writer of the novel, uh, placed the, uh, the the iceberg in the way of the Titanic to sell more copies yeah. of Atlantis. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Titanic truther. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a specific and very obscure thing to have a conspiracy theory about <laughs> i bet that there are some people who have conspiracy theories about the titanic disaster but probably not this one um there there are for sure many titanic conspiracy theories i don't know if this one has been broken yet <laughs> um, uh so this movie was banned in norway when it came out because they thought it was extremely tasteless uh it's being you know it's being based on something that I believe it's kind of partially censored in the U.S. too, based on that. Um, it's it's being based on something that came out before the Titanic disaster, and that was their defense, I think. But really, like yeah. they knew what they were doing, making a movie about yeah. a ship disaster a year yeah, after they, Titanic. They 100 percent did. Um, yeah, I mean it. Um, yeah, it's the. It is based on a book that was written before and like the filmmakers I think did say like no 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 like it's different but it's like they I do think they knew what they were doing um to some degree um I mean we we have watched a couple films that either were directly about the Titanic disaster or sort of alluded to it yeah um and they they all used uh some of them used an actual ship for part of it but they all used uh, miniature models for the actual sinking. This film, as far as I can tell, yeah. they just sunk a real ship. Or they built like a gigantic sinkable set that looked like a ship. Um, I, I think at the time it was probably easier just to buy an old ship and sink it. <laughs> like, yeah. This looks like... I, I My jaw dropped when I saw that ship sinking. It, like, uh, this, it, it looked... It, I mean, it's huge. It looked ridiculous. Yeah. Apparently, this was the most expensive movie that Nordisk, the uh, the production company, ever made. Uh, and it didn't make its money back, but it was still their most popular movie they ever made. Um, one quick thing to go back. The, uh, the film was censored in the US, but not because of the Titanic connection, but because there is, I think, one shot of a sculpture of a topless woman. And Americans couldn't oh, have any. That's right. Any I messed that up. In my nude head. sculptures in their films, <laughs> so that's what they censored. Um, oh my! Um, but the uh, the plot around this ship disaster is the film tells the the sweeping and heartwarming tale of a doctor who abandons his children <laughs> so that he can travel and hit on women. Oh, oh not no, his children. He doesn't just abandon his children. He also abandons his uh, his his mentally sick wife. <laughs> yes, that too. Um, yeah, his his wife is introduced at the beginning as having a sort of vague mental illness, 
Um, so as as is the custom of the time, she is sent away to a a dark <laughs> unknown place. Um, and the uh, the husband, the doctor, is so just so upset by this. He's real bummed. That he, uh, you know. He's so bummed that he just he has to go out and just start hitting on people. Um, so he like immediately is just like, all right, I guess I just have to like go out and start meeting some new some new gals. Um, he meets a a dancer, uh, who has lots of sort of admirers. She has her sort of entourage of uh, of simp's around yeah. her. <laughs> I wrote I wrote um, simp's of the high seas. Um, <laughs> as a as a sequel to Simps of the Old West, but I feel like we can't have too many titles like that. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so he the reason he gets on the uh, ocean liner is she is going to New York, and so he wants to follow her to New York, and so he gets on the same boat. And there's all of these scenes of him, like him and other people, just like trying so hard to flirt with her on the yeah, boat, trying to get her attention, like, hey, hey, look at me, look at me. Yeah, and like. <laughs> Just the most blatant, you know, bald attempts at like, oh, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. Um, just pathetic simping all around. And he, he, there's so many other people around this dancer that he has the hots for that he kind of either loses interest or just kind of gets distracted. He gets discouraged, I think. Yeah. He, he looks um, so sad. He, he just starts, he just starts flirting and smooching with other women on the ship that he happens upon. Um, <laughs> um, and then so that the ship sinks, uh, they get rescued and, and make it to New York. Um, and they sort of get him and the dancer kind of get together in New York, but he pretty quickly loses interest because she is sort of still flirting with all these other dudes. And he's like, I can't have that. I abandoned my, my ill wife for you. So <laughs> he then... He's now just living in New York. He's like, hey, you know, I still have a wife and children, but fuck them. Um, and he meets a sculptor, uh, a female sculptor, and uh, falls ill, presumably with loneliness. He gets very ill. Oh, he get, well, he gets ill because he gets a letter from back home that his wife died. Um like he gets a he gets a cable and and he's so yeah he puts him in a in a in a state of of sadness yeah. and and he gets ill from from the sadness um uh but the sculptor that he meets sort of heals him back with uh presumably with smooches um <laughs> and finally finally after like a year of of you know in film time he finally goes back he decides that this sculptor will be the new mother to his children yeah she is worthy and he finally goes home to his three kids <laughs> that he has completely abandoned um and we get a sort of theoretical happy ending um but the whole time it's just like this guy is such a dick oh yeah no he's not a good dude <laughs> um it's it's also weird because like the the structurally um because the the shipwreck happens i mean i to i guess this is more than a titanic movie it's really like it's yeah. it's really a kind of meandering drama that features mm-hmm. a shipwreck um yeah and which which is like 1 hour into the 2 hour long movie um and a lot of it is uh <laughs> a lot of the in- idiosyncrasies of this movie i think are due to the writer of the novel who was involved in Mm. the making of the movie um for example when they get back when the ship arrives in new york they get to uh they they go they go to a show of one of the other people who was on on the boat and it is uh it's kind of a vaudeville show of a guy with no arms who uses his feet like arms like hands yeah um which is incredibly impressive yeah this guy has so much dexterity with his feet um no reason for him to be in the movie no reason for for him to be in the movie except that there are elements of this that were autobiographical apparently and the author 
insisted that a couple of his buddies be in the movie. Oh my and god. And that guy, that foot guy was one of them. <laughs> I mean, this isn't like a brief, like, oh, there's like a, a brief scene where there's like this guy with no arms. He's like... It's like five minutes. A, he could be like a supporting character. Like, they dedicate so much time to this dude. Yeah. So, like, he does his full act in the movie. They just show his whole... Thing. yeah yeah with like some close-ups and 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 whatnot yeah and like it's cool but it's also like why is this in the movie? it's extremely irrelevant i mean apparently uh uh august blum and and the other people making the movie were not super happy about all the demands that the author hmm. made um because he, he mandated that they stick as closely as possible to what happened in the book um, mm. so the movie is very accurate, but, um, they made an alternate ending, uh, uh, to the movie that is not the ending in the book, which is a sad ending for the Russian audience. Uh, because <laughs> they, those Russians, they love their sad endings. They, they, I guess they had this info that they were like, Russians love sad endings. So we're going to shoot an alternate sad ending where instead of falling in love with this new person he deems her worthy to be the mother of his children and he heals instead he just gets sicker and dies and then she cries over him and (laughs) and that's the this is not the only movie this is not the only movie to do that though. no yeah uh Uh, there were other films from this uh i can't name drop any of them but there were other films from this era that also shot alternate endings for the russian market that were just the sad ending. They were just like, this is in this one, everyone dies. It's kind of amazing. Uh, but so along the lines of, you know, trying to fight with the author of the book, they, the Russian sad ending could only, like, they mandated that it could only be shown in Siberia, like on the far end of Russia, because uh, they thought that him living in Germany, like he wouldn't really catch wind of this, all the way on the other side of Russia. Oh, really? And so, like, I, I believe on the on the eastern or the on the western side of Russia, they played the the European version. <laughs> wow, um, that's crazy. This the the author of the original book also uh, uh, was interested in eugenics and later became a Nazi. Um, oh, and uh, so there's been a bunch of those. I guess just people from the 1910s tended to do that. Yeah, they yeah. were living in Germany at the time. Um, he um and my guess is that they make a point of saying that the wife's uh uh mental illness is hereditary and i'm thinking that that might have something to do with this guy's eugenicist beliefs i don't know why Oof. i was all like we're just saying bad things about this movie i don't know why i <laughs> i liked it so much but i, I was just entertained the whole time and I, mean, I watched it is it's got great production value yeah, you know yeah. it's it's uh it's a very showy film. I, so. I watched this right after I watched Traffic and Souls, and I was so mad at the like at bad editing in that movie that that this movie like actually having like decent decent moment to moment editing. Uh, they could have mm-hmm. cut a lot of time out of the movie, but decent moment to moment editing. Uh, it it endeared me to it or endeared yeah. it to me. I mean, there's a lot of great shots in this. Um, yeah, there's. A couple, a couple shots that are really shallow focus, which is something we haven't really seen much of. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't even really think it's intended here as a sort of artic- artistic flourish or anything. I think it's purely because it, the scene takes place in a dark cabin hmm. that is very underlit, and so they needed to, when you when you open the aperture on a lens, the the sh- the focus gets shallower, and so I think that was just a byproduct. Of that, but it, it makes it makes those shots feel really kind of moody and, and cool. Yeah, I mean, I think there were some there were some pretty casually showy shots in this movie, and if I think back to the white slave handle, it also had a couple of just randomly, very pleasingly um, composed shots in it. Yeah, August Blum is a good, a definitely a good visual director, if nothing else. Yeah. I think has a pretty good uh, a pretty good idea of storytelling. Um, 
for the time period. Yeah, yeah. the the Dutch um, The Dutch people are are a good a good deal better than than some other groups uh, at this time. Uh, <laughs> um, one one bit of fun trivia is uh, later famous Hollywood director Michael Curtiz was the assistant director on this film. Yeah. Back when he went by his Hungarian name, which I have not written down and probably cannot pronounce. That was the same situation for me. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> um, so I will refer to him as Michael Curtiz. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know him by name, but he went on to direct Casablanca <laughs> and uh, yeah. White Christmas. A film you may have heard of. <laughs> uh, so that's cool. Yeah. Uh, another notable European film uh, from this year was The Student of Prague. Yes. Which I I rather enjoyed. It's very spooky. Uh yeah, I um, <laughs> I I gotta say that the video quality on this one was so so terrible, so bad that absolutely I atrocious. had a very hard time getting into it. Yeah, um, is very true. Uh, this is also, by the way, is a kind of du- uh, a Danish slash German situation Mm -hmm. kind of mixing together in there and making movies um it does feel it i would not describe this as a german expressionist film i don't think it's nearly surreal enough for that no there is some moments of surrealism in it but it does feel like kind of a precursor to those it's films a little bit it's sometimes referenced as an early german expressionist film though i would agree with you that it does i don't really feel like it makes the mark yeah but it doesn't quite count but there are um the 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 main actor went on to make some bona fide german expressionist films later on main actor slash co-director did he co-direct he did okay um i think i hope i got that right I feel like I might have heard that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it starts out almost kind of feeling like a rom com at times. Um, it follows this uh, this student, uh, who is, uh, described as the wildest and best swordsman <laughs> in all of Prague. Um, which I wish that could I could say that about my time my days as a student, but. Um, well, I so you he, know that's uh, funny. I I was a swordsman when I was in college, uh, but uh, I was I was not the best on the fencing team. So <laughs> <laughs> I was neither the wildest student nor the best swordsman. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, so Baldwin, uh, is is out riding one day and uh, saves a a rich countess, and and falls in love with her, um, even though there was another girl in town. That is clearly in love with him, but is not a countess. He's Um, a climber, definitely. (laughs) Uh, Not as much of a climber as the girl from town who's in love with him, who is (laughs) very good at climbing in this movie. Yes. Uh, She's always climbing up into the back of scenes, uh, kind of prowling on him. Yeah. Um, There is a scene where we're introduced to the countess where she is sort of riding through the woods and this, this guy who I guess was her fiance or some such is out hunting and has just an army of dogs with him. Yeah. Very cute. There is a, a, an actual flood, a tidal wave of dogs. There are probably about a hundred dogs. <laughs> um, one shot never shows up again in the movie, but I was yeah. just like, that's, that's an amazing yeah. shot of a tidal wave of dogs. Dozens of blurry dogs. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, so Baldwin kind of feels that he can't uh, compete for the, the Countess because he's broke and she's super rich and is going to rich people parties. So um, what he does is he makes a deal with a creepy old wizard that he meets, which as you do, you know, as you do, always ends well. Um, so the old wizard uh the deal he makes is he'll he'll get rich if the old wizard can take anything he wants from baldwin's room and baldwin's like fine like i don't own anything so go for it um but what that rascally wizard does is he takes his reflection from the mirror yeah which is a really cool scene 
very cool scene. I couldn't really figure out how they did it at first because the reflection literally walks out of the mirror and out of the room. I mean, I assume they did um, what, like what they did in the Baron Munchausen movie where they made a a double, like a room behind the mirror, right? Yeah. Um, but then even the the sort of doubling of the actor, I was like, wait a minute, how? But then what? And there's no clear sort of like split screen. I was reading that. Going I, on. I mean, maybe not. It in was that a split scene, screen. Um, but I was reading that there were a lot of really advanced splits. I, I mm-hmm. wasn't actually sure of this because the quality was so low. But um, <laughs> uh, the it both of them, at least for most of the movie, both of the doubles were played by the same actor, um, and they were mm-hmm. using double exposure to have both of them in the screen at once. And uh, from what I read from people who watched a movie of this where they could see things more clearly is that <laughs> it it was done super, super seamlessly. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, it passed the smell test to me, definitely. Um, it took me a while before I could really say that, like, I'm pretty sure this is split screen. Like, for a while, I was like, wait, I'm not sure how they're doing this. Which is very cool. Yeah. Um, so now Baldwin's got this this doppelganger of him walking around. Um, but he's super rich. Um, and so he's sort of trying to live the the rich the rich guy life. Um, but this doppelganger keeps kind of popping up at inopportune times, and freaking him out. The uh the sort of uh not wealthy girl that clearly has a thing for Baldwin gets this sort of romantic rival for the countess to duel baldwin but his dad asks him not to not to kill him but then the doppelganger ends up going to the duel and killing him before he can show up and so the doppelganger is just sort of like going around murdering people and just making life difficult for for uh for baldwin yeah um there's some really great architecture in this movie just throwing that out there. Yeah. Um, just because it's Prague, and Prague has nice architecture. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that at the points where I felt most sold on the idea of it being German expressionist were some of the scenes toward the end where he's hunting mm-hmm. down the doppelganger, and there's some kind of dark dark scenes with jagged buildings uh, that evoked some of the kind of... Um, uh, deep shading and dutch angles and whatnot of uh yeah. german expressionism you can definitely i definitely got the sense that i think more thought went into the lighting and the composition than a lot of other films from this time period mm, yeah it seems a little bit more deliberate in terms of like framing stuff in very specific ways to have like things creeping up in the background or uh stuff like that um but yeah somewhat spooky yeah i will say overall kind of fun one one thing that was in this movie and actually all of the feature films that we watched uh which is not a new thing but i it it almost feels like considering how universal it has just been it might be this new established uh, action is that all of these movies began with a sort of like here are the players uh, mm. uh intro mm-hmm. um where yeah. it would say you know it, it it would the camera would focus in on on the main character and it would say this is the name of the main character and then it would go on to the next one and it would introduce them all one by one in these kind of like moving portraits uh uh that we first saw in the girl a, a girl who did not believe in santa claus that's and right the old boy yeah who did. um Thank you, Edwin. What a groundbreaking film that was! <laughs> yeah, uh, and the the this one did it in a little bit more of an elaborate way, in that it had like curtains that opened and closed, almost like a stage on them. That's where right, yeah. the other ones were kind of just the people standing there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so standing there making faces. Um, Phantomas also kind of does that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't find a point to mention that in the Phantomas discussion, but uh, it fades from each costume to the next uh, that that he, that that he plays 
it, and and so you see all the different characters like that. It only did yeah. it in the first two episodes, though. Well, they didn't want to give away what what disguises he was going to. Oh, have true, true. <laughs> uh, um, I guess this brings us to our final feature of the week. Yeah, which is probably the most well known, or the the most sort of culturally or historically important one. Yeah, which is Quo Vadis, which is another uh, Italian historical epic. Um, <laughs> not my favorite. <laughs> An Italian historical epic, aka so boring. <laughs> oh my god! For the first half, the second half I enjoyed quite a bit more. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a hard time watching uh, Cab- Cababria or. or next week uh I'll, I'll give it an honest shake but like you know we've watched a couple of these movies right re- la- recently like the fall of troy and um uh uh inferno do to a lesser degree where these yeah. italians do big movies with no soul and no storytelling <laughs> chops you know it's just big yeah yeah um i mean this is a very big film especially in that second half yeah um one kind of interesting thing I read about it is that there's a lot of crowd scenes in this movie and apparently they would have crowds of live actors at screenings come out for those to kind of bolster them even more. Yeah. This, I mean, part of the thing that was notable about this movie was that it was an event movie Um, because this was so long and such a big production. They didn't screen this at normal theaters. Really? They, they opened it up in like opera house, opera houses and performing and, you know, arts stages, that kind of thing. Uh, so it had this kind of air of sophistication to it that I think a lot of other movies didn't at the time. Yeah, it certainly had a sort of, uh, I don't know, a sort of uh, prestige, as it were. Yes. Um, it were. They, so they really kind of sold it as... Hail Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> they really kind of sold it as this this sort of epic event thing that... Yeah, it was just like, um, it wasn't as much of a, um, I don't know, it was, it was definitely, they were trying to attract the sort of, the upper crust, I think a bit more, and, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really know for sure, but I kind of get the sense that it was sort of given more attention through marketing, maybe, hmm. um, of sort of like, see the, the greatest, you know, moving picture ever made that sort of thing um yeah it was described at the time as a mammoth photodrama which is great that's ice age though right yeah it's true um i mean this this movie does get a lot of credit and is is definitely sort of marked as a sort of um a purely inspiring movie more so than a groundbreaking one i think sort of like people watch this and we're like Oh, okay. Feature films of this scope and length are a viable uh, option. Hmm. Um, this movie made a boatload of money. Um, it was very successful in that sense, um, and so I think it it uh, I think it sticks out m- less so as for its storytelling and more so for the way that it sort of opened up i guess the market for longer films yeah yeah for sure that's that's true it did kind of blaze that trail especially in america where longest film longer films weren't um as established or allowed uh i think the (laughs) i think the mpcc actually broke down in 1914 the year after this Mm. uh yeah which would put away all of those edison era restrictions on how long movies could be and that that kind of mm-hmm. thing um but yeah all that being said it doesn't really hold up so well um there's no good quality uh version of this film available anywhere as far as i can tell no on physical media or otherwise yeah um, it's all like for 144p web m yeah files oh on wikipedia <laughs> um and the actual story of it is you know kind of typical roman epic a lot of romans doing roman shit yeah yeah i mean kidnapping I guess it's like drinking wine 
Yeah, I guess that sort of it's, thing. It's like vaguely about you know, well, it's about Nero, or at least Nero is the antagonist. Mm-hmm. So, and it's a, it's yeah. about like early Christians who are being persecuted by Nero, including there's uh, probably the best scene of the movie uh, is. Uh, when they sick some lions on the Christians, and and you see the lions, the lions like tearing flesh. Um, <laughs> for I mean, for you, a brief you, moment. you gotta love, you gotta love any movie that puts lions in it. Oh yeah, uh, um, there was that uh, the Roman orgy that uh, Louis Fiat did yeah. a couple years ago, where or uh, that that emperor just unleashed lions on his party because he was bored. Yeah, there's a lot of that sort of thing happening in this one. I mean. Uh, I didn't follow every sort of plot machination fully. There's a lot of, you know, uh, scheming going on in this movie. Yeah, um, that no one cares I kinda about. Got, I, I kind of got the sense that uh, Nero decides to burn Rome because he kind of just feels like it, and he wants to write some poetry. <laughs> and he's feeling, feeling feeling some writer's block for his poetry, and it's like, hey, how about I just burn the city down? I can write some poetry about that. Yeah, and then he just watches the, the city burn, and he's like, ah, perfect. <laughs> Great of yeah. my muse. <laughs> Which is a great scene. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like the first half is a lot of a lot of the scheming, a lot of the sort of like setting stuff up. Um, and because of the sort of very kind of uh, unsophisticated film language, I would say simplistic film language that hasn't really evolved much. Um, uh it feels kind of bland. Um, yeah. The first, the first half, I was, I was kind of in and out. I was like, oh man, this is kind of a chore to get through. Once the second half hits, it becomes Rome's burning. There's lions. There's fights. Uh, it gets a lot more interesting. Hiding in catacombs. Yeah. Um, all of the sort of big scale stuff happens in that second half. Um, the first half, there's actually a bit where it that the intertitle says Rome in all of its immensity and then we cut to one room <laughs> with like three people in it. <laughs> um I listened to this movie uh with the Gladiator soundtrack over it, which uh did a lot to Thank help. Thank you for the that recommendation. Value, yeah. Yeah. That did a lot to to kind of bump up its entertainment for me. Um I mean there's there's a couple scenes that use kind of light and shadow in interesting ways, I think during the fire and during the the scenes of the the Christians who are hiding out in the catacombs, yeah, and and tinting. I mean, uh, we saw this in the yeah. Nero movie from I believe nineteen oh eight, but uh, putting a big orange tint to just sh- sell that a whole city is burning, it, it works mm-hmm. really well. Yeah, um, just like the the blue tint for night. Yeah, that is something that we still use in films as just like it's blue it's nighttime like <laughs> orange filter just like there's fire is still very much a a thing like it's a little bit there's a little bit more to it now but it's basically the same thing um i mean there's there's like a chariot race and some gladiator fights which are fun um so yeah i mean i can see why people watch this and we're like ah oh, bravo such such scale and panache. I mean, it's attempting a type of seriousness, right? I think, uh, uh, it, you know, I make the comparison to comic books in the 90s uh, and how movies right now are kind of desperate to be being seen as serious. Mm. <laughs> Comics in the 90s, video games in the 2000s. And, and how... Mm. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I have made, I don't remember if I've do- said on the podcast, but I made the comparison of D.W. Griffith to Frank Miller, where, like, he's this extremely racist guy who loves just, like, darkness, and and that's how he sells the seriousness of this new medium, is I'm gonna make everything dark and gritty, you know? Uh, and this movie is another kind of appeal to seriousness, where it's very stately Mm -hmm. and and very grand you know yeah um which is funny because i actually feel a lot of the grandiosity of this movie is so over the top that it makes it kind of comedic (laughs) um particularly i think a lot of the performances come across that way 
Um, and just, yeah, just the, like, the, the sheer sort of, like, big, everything is played so big. Um, you know, at least, at least Griffith tends to go for some subtlety in, in the performances occasionally. That's true. When Griffith goes big, it means something. Um, because he's invested in character. Um, yeah, Kovatis is, is, it's, it's, it's. It's relying entirely on its scale to sell itself. Yeah. Um, <sighs> but hey, you know, that's something. Movies. Um, now more than ever. <laughs> so now that we're in the era of feature film, uh, I hope you join us along on this uh, on this new journey. Uh, this perilous journey. This perilous journey of crappy movies <laughs> uh, that will soon get better. I, I'm I'm certain. Right now, we're yeah. I mean, in every jump, right in every time jump, mm-hmm. especially the first couple of years, they really struggled to know how to fill the time. When we went from one yeah. minute to five minutes, when we went from five minutes to ten or fifteen minutes, when we went to ten yeah. or fifteen to multiple reels. And now that we're at feature films, we're, we're having people just not know how to fill the time properly for the first couple yeah. of years of, of doing it. For all of the like interesting experimentation, because they don't know what they're doing yet, there is an equal, if not greater amount of just stuff that does not work and is a chore to sit through. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know, it's a growing medium. Yep. You know, there's going to be there's going to be some growing. And things. we do it for you. Don't watch Quo Vadis. Uh and I think that'll about do it for this episode. I think so. Uh, I think we've I think we've, we've exhausted ourselves by this. Glenn, point. what was your favorite uh, uh, film of this episode? I mean, is Phantomas? Yeah, like n- n- without much question. Um, I think probably if you'd asked me after watching just the first episode, I might have said suspense. Yeah. Um, I might have even said uh, Traffic and Souls. Mm-hmm. Um, but after the, the second two episodes, especially the, I think the third episode of Phantomas is like really impressive storytelling. Um, yeah. And it's very, very well made. Um, and it's also super fun. There's that... like he tries to kill Juve with a snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't watch Covatus, but do watch Phantomas. I highly recommend it. And there's a. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a really gorgeous HD uh, uh, Blu-ray of Phantomas out there. Um, I, man, I forgot about Phantomas because I kind of put it in a different category. I was going to say suspense, but mm. eh, I'll count Phantomas as something different so that I can say suspense because suspense was okay. super cool. Uh, yeah, suspense is worth lauding and and putting on our our episode description as one of our favorites <laughs> yeah um well speaking of our episode description within it you can find links to uh, all sorts of ancillary information uh such as the uh newspaper page which can you please send that to me glenn um, sure i gotta find it again now uh and uh, uh we'll have links to all of the movies that we talked about so you can watch them yourself and we also have links to all of our social medias uh, so you can follow us on Instagram, which is where I post most often, um, and Twitter, which I post only to notify the world that we have new episodes. Um, and, uh, you know, all that's it, that, that, that kind of stuff. Also follow Marco at Fleetwood Marco on both of those platforms where he talks mostly about X-Men on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I guess a lot of a lot of X Men talk this episode. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm all for it. Uh, and with that, uh, Glenn, I'll see you next year. See you next year. Yeah.